Welcome to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. Our goal is to help you maximize your church's potential. You'll hear from top leaders in children's, student, and family ministry about the principles and practices they use. Now here's your host, Nick Blevins. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 208 of the podcast. We've got my friend Todd Lesher on today. We're going to talk all about family ministry online, in person, the journey that his church has been through. We're also going to talk about some key things that he focuses on as he leads his team. And I just think they're really helpful. So they're certainly going to make their way into what I think are my top three action steps. I share those coming out of every podcast episode. So take a listen. You'll see what I think. I imagine you'd probably agree with the the, the things that I pick for that. But before we jump into that, we're near the end of the launch of Ministry Boost membership for this season. It'll be the last time that membership is open for 2020. It won't open again until 2021. So if you're listening to this episode, the week it comes out, there's this week, there's next week, but October 30th, membership will close for the year. And you'll also get the new digital church course as a bonus if you sign up by this week. October 23rd. So you'll want to register by then if you want that bonus, but membership will be open another week after that. And we come up with new pricing points now. So it's $27 a month for an individual, just $47 a month for your entire church staff to have access to everything. There are ministry booths, 30 plus courses, four resource bundles, two that are out now, two that will be out in November. And you get all that for that one price. So go to ministryboost.org if you're interested in that. And that's all I have for now. Check out the notes, as always, at nickblevins.com slash episode 208. But let's jump into my conversation with Todd Lesher. Well, today I'm talking with Todd Lesher. Welcome to the podcast, Todd. Hey, Nick. Good to be here. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about you, your family, and your church as we get started. Yeah. So I'm married to my wife, Abby, and we have three kids. I've got a 12-year-old boy, so I'm in the middle school phase, and I've got a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. So I'm in middle school and elementary phase and loving most every minute of it, uh, navigating that, trying to apply uh, ministry principles to home. Uh, Don't always correlate, but sometimes they match up. (laughs) Like I read this in a book somewhere. Why doesn't it work here? But um, I've been (laughs) been doing uh, some form of uh, next-gen family ministry for almost 20 years now. And a lot of that was spent in student ministry. And now I'm a a next gen pastor at Forest Hill Church in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. So I have to ask, uh, this is totally not planned. So I'm just going to throw your curveball right off the bat. But when anytime, you know, as you know, most people that become next gen pastors, the vast majority of them led kids or student ministry. And a lot of times if you just did a survey, it's almost 50, 50. And certainly that's a different experience. Just a couple of points. I'd love to hear you talk about what was it like going from student ministry to family ministry. And then now that children's ministry thing was in, you know, kind of in your purview and how did you adapt and learn and figure out how to do that well? Cause they're different. Yeah. Um, so I, I can remember it clear as day. And I think you and I were, had some of those early conversation. I'd be like, Hey Nick, uh, I'm new to this. What do I do um, here? So having conversations with other people who are a couple steps ahead or a couple years ahead was huge for me. And uh, the networks that we're a part of and that we've been connected to have been tremendously helpful. So that's a starting point. Uh, secondly is I don't know everything. I, I think some people look at us and go, hey, you're passionate about this. And they assume they must know everything, but I don't. So <laughs> taking a posture of learning um, and reading books, podcasts, everything like that. Um, and then the the part of making the connections to children's ministry. I think the thing that I benefited most was I saw children's ministry as a partnership from the very beginning. And I know that's not always the case for children's ministry and student ministry, but somewhere along the way, God gave me the mindset of, Hey, one day that kid is going to be in my student ministry. I better invest in them now. I better get to know their little brothers, little sisters. And that allowed me to be at least aware of and conscious of children's ministry but then when we we brought the ministries together under family ministry, um, it was relying on the experts in those positions already, learning from them instead of just saying, hey, um, we're going to do it this way because I think it's best, but learning from those who have done it before to figure out what's best together. 
Yeah, and there's, I mean, I'm of the mindset that they're at, like children's and student ministry is far more similar than people think, especially if you've only yep. served in one or the other. Once you serve in our role, you start to realize, oh, you have volunteer processes and you have groups <laughs> and you have large group and you yes. have partnering with parents and you communicate. Like, like there's like all these things that are could be the same, not that they are the same. Uh, yep. and, but then there is that percentage that's very different. And so I know I came from the children's background, although all my volunteer, when I volunteered before ever working for a church, it was student ministry. So yeah. I guess I had a little bit of a taste of both, but yeah. my, you know, f- full-time vocational role was kids ministry. So that's always an interesting journey and a new people in our role. You know, that's one of the things they're always trying to figure out. It's okay. I feel like I got this part down. I've done it for 15 years. Yeah. I don't know this one at all. Like, how do, yeah. how, do I, how do I get help there? So I want to ask about, you know, like I'm having a lot of these conversations on the podcast recently about what, what are you doing now? What have you been doing online? Uh, you're gathering it in person, so we'll talk about that. But what did going online look like even months after COVID shut things down in person for your kids' ministry and your student ministry? What did you do and what did you change? Yeah, yep. So I would say the first word that comes to my mind, it was hustle. I mean, things mm-hmm. just like turned on a weekend and we were live online as fast as we could be. And so we had kids ministry online, we had student ministry online, and we had uh, adult ministry online. So we were clicking in that way, but it took a little while for us to figure out how to connect more in person through a screen. So we had all the the programmatic elements up there, and we would put some of our staff and some of the videos, and you know we had interactive elements to that. But how do you make a uh, that interpersonal connection with children and students? And so it took a little while, but we got around to doing lunchtime Zoom calls uh, with preschoolers, elementary age school. Um, our small group leaders from middle school and high school were gathering up with their groups on Zoom. So the functionality of that was just incredible, and. I think, honestly, we saw some of that kind of, you know, teeter off over the span of time. And who knows what it is, the digital fatigue, Zoom Mm -hmm. fatigue, if you want to chalk it up to that, or the novelty of it just wore off. Um, But what we're having to learn now is how to uh, re-engage relationally, uh, because now we have phase two or three, whatever we're in, not necessarily for the virus, but for school is like now school is all digital. Uh, so how do we um, encourage and uh, empower our leaders and staff to connect relationally in that way? So did you, what did, like, did student ministry, did you do Zoom groups or like, what did that look like? We've talked about, you know, kids ministry for a lot of children's ministries. They put the content online. Maybe they did some kind of Zoom groups as a supplement, but putting that content online was mostly it for a lot of churches. Student ministry could have looked a lot of different ways. Some of them were streaming, streaming some kind of thing, even if it wasn't live, like they were yeah. custom creating their own experience. Some were just groups. Uh, what did you all do? Yeah, so our the main effort that we did was a Sunday night YouTube premiere. So we would be live on YouTube, kind of a centralized. We've got a couple of campuses. So we pointed everyone in that direction. And then we experimented with a couple different things. Uh, we used Kahoot a couple of times to do uh, family ministry wide game nights. So we invite everybody into that and we'd have questions ranging from preschool up through high school. So it, it hit everybody at some point in their life. Um, but then we did things throughout the week, whether it was a, like the lunch break that I mentioned before, but we would do uh, middle, middle and high school Bible studies on Instagram to try to connect with them in that way, try to meet them where they're at. So those are a few things that we tried. Yeah. And you described with the kids part, and this may have been true for students too, there was like that drop off. I feel like that's every church. I mean, very few churches actually, I think of one and I'm not even sure how true it was that there saw that drop off. Now you started gathering in June, late June, maybe. So yeah, maybe that changed some things, but I'd love to hear what did that look like for your church, for kids ministry, for student ministry. And now you've had some weeks under your belt too. What's that been like? Yes. Some of the decision-making process that went into it uh, was some of the permissions given to us. I live in the North Carolina, South Carolina area, so not every state um, allows this, but we were granted the permission to gather again. Um, And where it started with was if for us to have children's ministry and student ministry, it all depended on where our volunteers were at and what the capacity ratios were as well. So we had to juggle through all that. And we went through a a reservation system to be able to 
plan accordingly and make sure all our facilities were clean and ready to go so the environment was safe. And then once we started ministry, what we saw was that because we call it big kids and little kids, little kids is preschool, big kids is elementary school. We saw that we were able to do big kids ministry first before we were able to do little kids ministry. And the main reason for that is because you can gather in a large group and you don't need as many volunteers because you have less numbers to begin with, but you can spread them out and the staff can uh, organize that group a little bit more effectively with a handful of volunteers who are willing to show up as well. And then a few weeks later, we were able to start preschool. And the surprising thing for that is the way we organized the program was we would do the little kids experience and we use 252 with orange, but um, we would show that for the entire family. So parents would bring their preschooler in, they would watch that for 20 minutes, and then we would switch over the screen so they could watch the service uh, as a family. We had crafts and games for kids to play, but we've actually seen our preschool uh, environment grow by a few individuals at a time from week to week. So they're trusting us more or they're seeing that we've put some things in a place that engage their child. Yeah. So you kind of had like, cause I've heard of churches doing what I would call like a family service that they're streaming yep. it separately and you can sit in there as a family and that way it's not as distracting in the main room with kids. Like I think about me sitting in there with our kids. It's like, yep, <laughs> that would not be fun. But in a family service where it's a bunch of other kids too, it's like, yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, so, okay. So, and you're, is that live broadcast to this other space kind of thing? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, so is I that true for elementary or just preschool? Just preschool. Okay. Yep. So elementary, you could your kid would go there like normal. You go to service. You're That's right. Back together afterwards. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you're getting like if you have a preschooler and an elementary kid, their kid goes elementary, but then they go okay, they go with their preschooler to that environment. That's right. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. And has that been the way since you started? That was the plan from day one. No, uh, we had one campus uh, initiate that. It was kind of an innovation that they tried just to capture both audiences there. Um, because, and I don't know if this is the case for you uh, at your church, but our room capacity limited you know, a decent number of sites. So we'd say, okay, we can have four people in this room because of the limited size. Now we need to have one for the adult and one for a surprise child who shows up. So you really only have room for two. <laughs> yep, like, yep, yep. Let's open our large group spaces so we can actually uh, gather more together. Cool. Well, and we haven't gathered in person yet. So this is all still, you know, I'm just I'm learning from other churches. You're yeah. experiencing a lot of what other churches are experiencing. We were talking before that you're getting 20 to 30 percent of your pre-COVID yep. attendance, which is very standard. A lot of churches are getting that some growth. So and again, yep. churches are see seeing that, too. Were there any other things you had to change from like launch week one or two policy wise, process wise to, you know, make it work or keep things safe or whatever that might be? Uh, it, it's been stuff, uh, little stuff here and there about our check in process or reservation uh, system. You know, we've uh, flow of traffic has been a, a big one just so that we don't have uh, clogs along the way. But we found over time, like one campus opened a different entryway for families to enter. And then they found, well, it's not clogging as much as we thought it would. So we moved it over to the main entrance and that allowed us to streamline the entrance. Uh, so we've, we've been able to change and adjust as we've gone. We've, we have not fixated on this is the way it's going to be and you have to deal with it. No, we're trying to be flexible so people can engage. Well, you really got to be flexible in this time because everything oh, else totally. changes too. So the things you yep. can't control, uh, they keep changing. Are you getting uh, another conversation that you know is common is, Churches will get 20 to 30% in attendance. They're only getting half their volunteers. So it works, right? Because if you're getting half the volunteers, but only 30% of the kids, you still have enough to make it work. Is that your experience? You have enough that's working or is there, I don't know, it's leaning too far one way or the other? Yeah. So when we ran our survey, we, I think like a lot of churches, got a 50-50 response of we'll come back and we're not quite sure if we will. And I think truth is that, 50 that said they were willing to come back probably dropped down to more of a 25, 30%. And so we're dealing with that. And I guess that is probably pretty consistent across the board. Yeah, I've seen that too. Our survey, we, our surveys probably had really four categories, but you could almost divide them in half between coming, probably coming, and probably not coming. I mean, essentially that's what you could do. But I even, I mean, again, we haven't done it, so I don't know. But my take was, yeah, the at the half that are saying they're probably coming, 
they're not all coming. You know, it's like, what's uh, yeah, this reality? Yeah, 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 we'll probably show up. I mean, that was one of the answers is, uh, we're, I'm a little nervous, but we'll probably attend. Well, you know, mm-hmm. well, some of them just aren't going to do it, at yeah. least for some time. So that seems to be pretty standard. Anything else about meeting in person that you've learned or be helpful to share? I think just the, the part is that our team has really seized on the value of the kids who are coming is who God has brought. And, you know, the it can be really easy, and I've been there, but it, we all feel the discouragement of, hey, we were once this size, no matter what size that may be, and we're now this size. And so it however you define that as a fresh start, a new beginning, it feels like a church plant in some ways. It's like, hey, these are the people that God has brought. How are we going to intentionally influence their faith? That it's just taking advantage of what is right in front of us instead of going, oh man, remember the good old days? Yeah, they were great. And I wish they were back. But these are the days right now. Let's be faithful what God has given us. Yeah. And I didn't, I almost didn't ask this, but it's a great question to ask, especially since you have been meeting for a number of weeks, a couple months now. Uh, how have you balanced what you did online and are still doing online, I'm assuming, mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. adding an, an, not even just one in-person service? I think you got 10 across all your campuses. So how are you keeping both of those up? See, it was one thing yeah. when we had the one and not the other, and then the other one, but not in person. But now you have both. Yeah. That's, you know, for a lot of churches, that's hard because they've never staffed for that. Yeah, that's right. So the first thing that comes to my mind, it goes back to an answer before, but the summer, you know, summer break, the true summer break, it's been a six month summer break, but um, the the summer break probably caused some of that disengagement online. And so we were trying to juggle or balance, like, is it engaging physically or is it engaging online? And so what we chose to do was we probably pulled back a little bit with our online engagement. We still have uh, content for kids and students online, but it's it's less than it was. And some of that is to promote re-engaging to the comfort level that you're willing to. And then the other part of it is as we look forward to the school year and things getting back to that routine is let's let families settle into that new normal. And then let's come up with some relational ways to re-engage with kids and students. Yeah, that's a good thought. Well, I want to shift gears and talk about some principles you have. I don't know if you'd call them values or decision-making mm-hmm. principles or how you frame it up, but there's five things that we were talking about some of them before we yeah. recorded. And not just that these are, you know, I don't know, high level principles, but you actually are using them to make key decisions and change things, especially now. So mm-hmm. maybe you could run down the five things for us and then we could just talk about how, how they're playing out in ministry now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the past, this has been called the home plate uh, for our ministry approach. And the reason mm-hmm. we call it that is because it's our starting point and it's where we always return to. Um, like you, I grew up in the Maryland area, so I was a big Baltimore Orioles fan. And so baseball just resonates with me. I know mm-hmm. sports analogies aren't, aren't for everybody, but, yeah. um, and so I, I want to internalize these things. They don't, they don't necessarily show up in our organization, but they are, in the back of my mind behind a lot of the conversations that we have. So the five parts here are work prayer into your work, uh, be relational with all and intentional with a few celebrate steps, look for potential, not perfection. And the last one is help everyone succeed. I'm furiously taking notes over here just so you know. Uh, but, uh, and we were talking about, um, I love like what values, principles, decision making. Like th- for me, that's just helps with clarity, right? So things like this, I'm just yeah. I'm taking notes. Uh, mm-hmm. One because we're going to talk about it, but two because I'm probably going to steal some of these. Um, right. I just love. I just think they help simplify sometimes when ministry and yeah. in life decisions are hard, it's complex, and like what do we do? And that's certainly true now in the season that we're in. And sometimes these can be helpful just to be reminded, you know, what what matters most. And we were talking about a couple of these. And what that looks like in your life now. So if we start with the one about work prayer into your life, as opposed to you described yeah. it as the polls of the day, like the beginning and yeah. the end of the day. So yeah. has that, if that's always been a part of home plate, is there anything different now during this season? Like what's that looking like these days for you and your staff? Yeah, I think a, a big part of this and why it's so important back to the point you made about having values and principles is they act as anchors. And it, 
the reason this is the first one on the list, it probably should be first and last. So you can make it the list six just so for reemphasis, but it is so easy for us to be in the business of God's work and not join God in the work. And I, I think that's just natural. I found myself doing that for all these years of ministry is I can get ahead of God or I can be like, Hey God, thank you for your assistance. I've got, I've got it from here. I feel confident kind of the stress of change is over or uh, new decisions or projects that have to be worked through. And it's like, God, please join me. And so, especially during the season of COVID and quarantine, this was essential because the, the hustle of the beginning, the disruption that threw everything up in the air, and then the f- fatigue that came along with it, I, I felt like I was drifting. And I needed that anchor of prayer in the midst of my work instead of just at the beginning or the end of my day. And so I had to block off periods of time. And what I did for me was I started my work day with about 15 minutes of prayer, some scripture meditation. And then I tried to finish about five minutes of that work block before lunch with some prayer as well, just to say, okay, I'm handing this back over to you uh, because I'm feeling afraid. And then after lunch, I do the same thing. And so it just helped orient and ground the day um, in a way that, because I just felt like I was so disoriented without it. So let me ask this because it sounds like you've scheduled that too. So like you know, being yeah. in the day, but this was intentional. You planned it at the beginning, you know, yep. before lunch, after lunch. And I've always, uh, and maybe you've thought about this too, the scheduled kind of times of prayer. Uh, like with anything else, I can be good at it for a while or not good at it for a while. What I've yep. always wanted and have never been able to do as well as I'd want is what I would call like conversating without with God throughout the day. You know, like that yeah. I would just, you know, I th- I've heard, you know, I've been taught that. I know people who are good at that. Where they can come out of a meeting and pray for just 30 seconds in their head or they can go into a meeting and pray for it, or they can be driving somewhere and they think, and every now and then that'll happen to me randomly. I'm actually thinking about yesterday when there was a moment of that. Um, and, and for me though, it's triggered by like yesterday, it was just a gratitude thing. It's like, gosh, I'm so great. Yeah. Like just for me, I'm reminded of this right here. It's just so grateful about just thinking about my kids, but otherwise I'm not actually so great at it. Do you do any of that or is it mostly this scheduled? I'm making it intentional. So that's when I do it. Yeah, I I would say just my personality, I do really well with routine. So this allows me to anticipate what's coming up, but it also allows me to focus in on what I'm praying for and praying about. Um, So whether it's big stuff at church, whether it's the current season that we're in, or it's the next meeting, because I'm right there with you and thinking through those moments when I'm not as disciplined with working prayer into my work, then I'm getting your phone call. And when your face is showing up on my phone, it's like, Oh God, thank you for Nick. It, and it's really like a panic calls like, Oh man, let me, let me make this prayer real quick. And, and that's fine. I think God knows we're human and God knows we're flawed. So there's a lot of grace in this, but especially as leaders of God's church, Christ's church, um, partnering with him or letting him do his work through us. This I, I've found has really centered the work that I do. Well, how about the other, the second one you mentioned about relational and yep. all intentional with a few? And I'm mm-hmm. very curious about this. I don't. We didn't talk about any of this before we recorded, so I'm going to hear it all right yeah. now. Uh, I think one of the things, obviously, churches tried to do with COVID, and once they weren't in person, was obviously do online really well. But then the other thing I've seen a lot of churches do, including mine, is be more relational. And for us, that meant a lot of phone calls, and that's still continued. So I'm curious yep. as to what that principle looked like now. And, Mm -hmm. you know, did you ramp it up in a different way? Has it changed? Has it continued? Because now we're months and months in. It was one thing when we made calls the first month, and now it's month four or five or whatever. You know, it's different. So what's that look like? Yeah, so the principle here is based off just the model of Jesus, right? He had his his crowd that he was relational with everybody. He was so accessible, but he still um, had his, his core group of 12 and then his few with the three. And so I think as children's directors, children's pastors, student pastors, and so forth, um, that this should be our mindset. And I think one of the most applicable ways is to remember names. Yeah, phone calls are important. Text messages are important. And all of us struggle uh, to a degree um, in varying ways when it comes to names. But names is one of the most personal things that you can remember about someone's life and existence. And so start with that. And as you work prayer into your work, Pray for people by name. And I think God uses that to solidify them in our memory. But then we have to be intentional with few. 
that's that's just realistic. I think we take on the Messiah complex when we're like, I can be relational with all because I'm the only one who can reach them. That's yeah. that's crazy, and that's why our our volunteers and leaders are so um, important. And so, in this time of COVID and quarantine, we we started off by you know doing the smaller groups on Zoom and connecting in that way. I know my kids, when they would get to see their leaders on Zoom, they just loved it and could not wait for the next lunchtime with their leader. We did a church-wide, uh, church-wide phone calls. So however many numbers that was, but the discipline, I don't know who I heard this from. You may know um, who said it just in a, in a podcast, a leadership podcast, but let's just call five people a day, you know, just to, Again, another discipline. We can't get to everybody. That's overwhelming. But the the idea of eating an elephant, which I don't know where this came from, but you eat an elephant one bite at a time. Why why was it an elephant? Why wasn't it just a piece of steak? Yeah, well, <laughs> or, like... yeah or like a cookie. I mean, like or something like that. Like a, yeah, a huge cookie would be great. Elephant, not so much. <laughs> elephant shaped cookie. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so we did the phone calls, and now. I think uh, I just read Nona Jones's book um, from social media to social ministry. Mm -hmm. And there's something to be said about seeing a social media audience or your followers as a congregation. So how can we shift our mindset and say, Hey, this isn't just a number of people that follow me, but this is actually a congregation of people that I can pastor or a congregation of people that I can pray for that I can be relational with. So whether it's your Facebook group or whether it's your your Instagram feed or whatever that may be, how do you take a more proactive approach using messenger, texting, or whatever it may be just to check in on people that you may not normally do in that way? So using those digital platforms, and then here's here's the story that I'm still trying to unpack and see if it actually works now. But um, at the end of the school year, so your May, June calendar there was a principal, I believe in Chicago, who went door to door to every one of her students' homes just to check in on them and to, she would say to lay eyes on them. And it's like, yes. And she was driven by passion and calling. And so what does it look like for the church to reclaim visitation and not be weird about it? You know, it's like, oh, here they mm -hmm. come again, knocking on people's doors. But it's saying, hey, I'd love to show up in your neighborhood and just check in on how you're doing. Can we keep social distance? Do we have to wear a mask? Sure. Do what you need to do. But can you show up in someone's yard with some balloons, with the treat, with just, a, you know, a cookie, right? And let's, let's just make that connection. So it takes us back to maybe some old school ways of ministry, which many people do today, but trying to be proactive with what we have, what, we're, what we've been given. Yeah. What are the chances that visitation would come up in the last two calls that I've had? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Totally different context with somebody mentioned in the previous conversation too, which I thought that's really funny. That's clearly people like us that grew up in a church. He had grown up in a Baptist okay. church. Yeah, uh, what would we call it now? I mean, contact I work was a part of it. It was uh, yeah. at one point. Relational ministry, I don't know. Re and it is funny because we, I mean, my church is doing more of that stuff. Like our staff has shown up on doorsteps or a lot of churches have done like we did the um, – the kind of drive through kids ministry. We're giving you some stuff to use at home or whatever. And even that was a chance to visit. I mean, that's mostly what it was. There were moms crying, you know, just cause it had been a few months. That was, I think for us, that was in May, late May or June or something like that. So that was the first time, you know, you're seeing, and there's just a lot of power in that, you know, in those relational connections, uh, phone calls, all that stuff. Well, yeah. Since we have time, I'd love to you talk, love for you to talk about, few, you know, the other three, not necessarily all of them, but if you just want to pick one, and what does it look like now? Or maybe there's something different about that principle now than it was, you know, a year ago. Or even if it's not, if it's just, hey, this is how it's been even last year. This is how we mm -hmm. carried out this, you know, potential or steps or whatever it is. So you get to pick which okay. one. Okay. Um, I think the the most I think it's the most important one aside from prayer, and that's helping everyone succeed. It's just it's real easy. I'm sure this happens in the business world for sure. I have very little experience there, but in the church, we can get really siloed. And then especially when we're quarantined, we're siloed to our homes. And yeah, we can connect over the phone and over Zoom or whatever it may be, but how can we take the posture to help everyone succeed? So um, one of the questions that I've asked is, you know, how have I helped the ministries of our church accomplish their goals? And 
thinking through outside of family ministry, because I can get just so self-centered to say, okay, I've got to get my goals accomplished that I fail to partner with the rest of my church. And so how can I become an advocate for adult ministry? How can I become an advocate for special needs ministry? How can I become an advocate for our outreach ministry? Because at the end of the day, that has a reciprocal nature to it. And especially in this season where we're all looking for what is the effective way to do ministry when you start collaborating with one another and depending on the expertise or the insight or the experience of others, then we could actually grow. And I think that's what this season has forced us to do. So any encouragement to the listeners out there is you may not feel that from other people on staff or that you work from, but take that posture and it will that I think that's one of the greatest thing that changes the culture. Yeah, definitely. And then like you said, that reciprocal thing that comes, it, it, we're all working on one team. Yeah. It's going to get paid back. I know for us, sometimes practically that used to show up in uh, conversations about volunteers and so-and-so volunteer on my team's thinking about serving on. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then you find out how much you uh-huh. think you yeah. know, with the whole church in mind, <laughs> or if there's just a decision yep. that's, you know, church wide and it's going to impact you. It's not what you want for your ministry, but, and you may not even agree that it's better for the church, but that's the thinking. And then mm-hmm. how do you respond to that? That's another good example of that. Well, let's talk about both of the last ones. I'm curious about the yeah. steps thing because at some, and now and where we're ministering, I mean, there's already ministry online pre COVID, but now we're doing that more. We're doing that better. But then there's also in person, like, what does that look like now? So celebrating steps is about, it's about spiritual growth. It's the, the decisions that people make along their faith journey that are worth celebrating. Now, we're, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, as churches, we love conversion and salvation and baptism, and we we like to measure those as well. But what about the kid who showed up for the first time and then came back two weeks later? That's a step. They came back. First time is great, but when they return, that's incredible, especially when that's online. You know, if you create this engagement where someone comments on your post and you have an interaction with them and then it you know moves over into direct message in some way and that you were able to say hey why don't you read the scripture today why don't we share those stories to say this person took a step to make a comment on social media then to move over into an interpersonal conversation and then they made the decision to read something watch something listen to something that may have shaped their faith who knows how? So it's looking at every step as worth celebrating along with the huge things that happen in a person's faith along the way. Yeah. And I like how you broke it down because the steps, there are other steps now like that one yep. step may have been watching online and then maybe they did show up in person. So that's a different kind of thing, but then maybe they did that other thing online. You know what I mean? Like yep, it's just, yep. I mean, ideally yep. I think that's what the future of, church should be is that there's digital and there's in person and they kind of just work together seamlessly. Um, But we need to be careful to celebrate what happens online and not maybe downplay it enough. While at the same time, I had this question the other day, somebody asked me like, you know, would it be the goal if somebody's watching online Would the goal be that, that everything they do is just always online. And my Mm -hmm. answer was no. I mean, I eventually would want them in person at a church. And then they asked, well, what if that person's watching like in another state? I said, well, that's a good question. And I don't know a lot of churches yeah. doing this, but if you just ask me personally, I'd want to push them to go to a church probably yeah, in their yeah. area. And that means right. at some point they're actually not with us, so to speak, online. And I know people that do like Elevation Church Online or Life Church, and they're yeah. nowhere near a campus. And even then I wonder like how well are you connected to your church? If I don't know. It's just hard. How do you balance the two? But yeah. certainly celebrating those steps online as opposed to let's just get back to what we used to do. Yeah. Right? Now, do you feel like you've celebrated, you were celebra- your team was celebrating those steps pre-COVID well, and now you're celebrating online steps well, or are you just still working at that to make sure you're celebrating the online stuff? Yeah, I would say we're still working on that. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. It's so you get so utilitarian and you're like, we got to get the job done that it's like celebration is in the rearview mirror. And mm-hmm. I think, I think we missed that. So if the dust settles enough to say, Hey, let's look up and see what God has actually done. I I had, um, uh, one of our executive leaders said this comment to me and it just, I've thought about it and it's, it's really thought provoking, but of all, you know, of all of time, 
God knew that this was going to happen and he chose us to lead it. He's like, wait a second, God, let's go back to the drawing board. And uh, I'm going to come up with a different plan. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) But it's true. Yeah, definitely. All right, last one, seeing potential. What's the full phrase there? I look for potential, not perfection. So this is that's a good one for now. Okay. That's a good, I don't know if that's what that's supposed to mean. You're going to tell me in a minute, but when I hear that, (laughs) I think it's hard to be perfect at anything right now. I think you were on the call where one of the things I said, a conversation my wife and I were having and she's, her work is so busy today. For example, she's doing 12 hours on zoom calls, you know, training because she works for a homeschool curriculum company. And the comment she made was, I feel like we're doing so many things and, and failing in all of them. And she's kind of right. There's, I mean, there's some that we're probably doing okay. I think she's great at training. She's yes. just having to do way too, way too much of it. So there's probably some things we're doing well, but she's also right. There's a number of things where we're failing, and part of it's like we can't succeed at all these things. We almost have to look at potential and not perfection. Otherwise, we're just gonna feel like failures every day. You know what I mean? So yep. anyway, oh, totally. that may not be what you mean. So give, you know, tell me more. No, uh, you're right on. I mean, that's the the big kind of 20,000 foot view of this idea here is, I mean, we've said this about so many different aspects of life is there's a manual for putting a grill together, but there is no manual for parenting. And yet God just says, Hey, here's a child. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Good luck. (laughs) But especially in this season, it's like, Hey, there, we don't have a manual when it comes to it. So what is the right way to do it? And I think back to the visitation comment, we're getting back to basics of what is true about the church. And so, yeah, we proclaim the gospel both, you know, in word, but also in presence with people. So that's the relational component there. So I think the thing for us that we've wrestled through is if there's any apprehension of trying something, why? Just try it. You know, you may actually find out that it works and it wouldn't have worked in a previous season. So there is a lot of potential. It, it comes back to motivation. It's like, what is motivating you in the decisions that you're making? Are you hesitant to try something out because it won't be perfect? Well, hey, let's let's get, let go of that because we all know by now that it's not going to be perfect, but it can be authentic as well. So that that may help of saying, hey, this was an authentic attempt and it didn't work as maybe we had anticipated. And, and part of that is, when you, when you have a bunch of people wearing masks, you can't read faces anymore. And so it, mm-hmm. that's hard for preachers to begin with. Yeah. But when you're in a crowd, if they're not making noise and they're not clapping their hands, it's like, hey, I don't know if this is working. So you're uh-huh. just you're giving your best in that way. And then the, the other part of that is specifically for family ministry and children's ministry. Um, kids and students are human and they're going to make mistakes. But let's give them ownership. Let's give them some keys, like Kara Powell has said, you know, let's give them the keys to lead something and let them make some decisions and just brace for it. Some of it's going to flop, but I'd rather take a risk on a student and a child than not give them a chance. Mm, Yeah. My, uh, my pastor used to do student ministry for about 14 years. And one of the things he would say is, and not, and even if this did happen, it wouldn't be a big deal, but he said, I never had a student not respond to me personally challenging them, like empowering them or, or, you know, it'd be different if it was like, Hey, we need everybody to do this. Well, yeah, not everybody's going to do this, but when it was personal and he addressed them and spoke potential into them, he, they always, they always came through. I think there's something to that. You know, there's something to that. Cool. Well, I love that list. Uh, I I just love values and guiding principles and clarity, you know, just being able to come back to certain things and man, we need that now for sure. Uh, so I, I appreciate you sharing that and your experience online in person. Yeah, you're still going to be juggling those two, and we'll see. Yeah, we'll <laughs> see what the rest of the f- fall looks like and everything else. But how can people connect with you? Social media, anything like that? Yeah, um, most of my social media is the same. T Lesh. Um, I'm Todd Lesher, so it's just a nickname for me. So you can find that on Instagram, um, on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter as much, but Facebook, it's Todd Lesher as well. And then feel free to email me if you want to at um, church. It's Todd.lesher at forestill.org. All right. Awesome. Well, Todd, thanks for coming on the podcast. You got it. Thanks for your time, Nick. And thanks for all the work that you're doing. I don't know about you, but I enjoy hearing from other leaders and how they're navigating the season online, in person, both. And I enjoyed hearing that from Todd. I really enjoyed though him talking through that 
list of things that are kind of like what I would define as a culture or a code and, you know, something to go back to values for your team. And so some of the action items that stuck out to me were certainly work prayer into your work. I talked about how I could certainly do that better. I love his ideas around that. I think that's something you could do this week. Uh, You could come up with relational ways to re-engage kids and students. That wasn't one of the like big headings, but it's something that he talked about. And I love that idea. I think that's something we have to think about now because it is different. So what are new ways that we can re-engage with kids and students relationally? And then I think you could create your own code or culture or set of values and things that you're going to focus on now and use that with your staff. If you lead staff, use that with your volunteers. If you lead volunteers, there's something powerful about having specific language and then repeating it and putting you know emphasis on it and value on it and coming back to it over and over and over again. It helps create the culture we want. So as usual, you can get the notes at nickblevins.com slash episode 208. Don't forget to sign up for Ministry Boost membership in the next week and a half or so as you listen to this when it comes out because it closes October 30th, won't open again until 2021. And you can check all that out at ministryboost.org. Thanks for listening. I hope this is helpful. And we'll be back next week with another conversation with a leader about how he reassigned staff and volunteers into three different buckets to focus on what they need to focus on now with online and in-person and families in two different places. So be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And I'll catch you next time on the Family Ministry Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. We hope this helps you maximize your church's potential. We would love to hear stories of how you apply what you've learned. You can do that by leaving a comment on iTunes or in the show notes at nickblevins.com.